All right, I hope everyone's as ready as I feel right now. If you're excited to be at church, can you let me know it? Let's go. Good. Wonderful. Love it. Well, hello, everybody. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord today. If I don't know you yet, my name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Can we give it up for our first-time visitors as well? Come on. Every time. Every time. It's our privilege and our honor to have you here. We have a mission here at the church. You can say it with me if you know it. It's to be a lifeline by leading people into becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. Now is a great time to take out the bulletin notes that you were handed walking in. Uh, they, they get more important every week, okay, because we put more stuff in there for you to learn and grow, and there's some fill in the blanks in there. All the scriptures are there. If you're doing a sermon-based life group, you know, your question, your discussion questions are in there. Um, because we just like to have as many opportunities as possible for us to remember and retain everything that God wants to speak to us today. And if you did not grab that, go and grab it on your way out or grab it right now if you want. But if you love using your phone, you could download the YouVersion Bible app. We got that for you as well. You just make Lifeline Church your home church on there. You can find the event under the events tab and you can get all the notes right there. And the YouVersion Bible app is great for being on a daily Bible reading plan, which I encourage every single man, woman, and child that is trying to follow Jesus. That's going to be step one, get in that Bible every single day. And the YouVersion Bible app is a great way to do that. All right. Now is right around the time I start talking about this series, but today I want to tell you about the next series because next week we're starting a brand new series called Fear Not. Fear not. And yes, we planned it because it's October, y'all, and we want you to fear not. Now, this was so, so creative, so insightful on my part. You're supposed to laugh. I thought that was funnier. I don't know. It was funny to me. Um, but we're starting this. No, that's right. We're starting this new series all about fear because, well, a couple reasons, actually. Um, number one, there's a lot of misconceptions around spiritual issues. And so we're going to be talking about things like heaven and hell. We're going to be talking about things like the Holy Spirit, things that tend to freak even well-meaning Christians, long-time Christians, freaks you out. But there's also a lot of other things that are bringing stress and anxiety in our world starting in October. We're like starting to get into election time. So I know that there's a lot of people that are freaked out about that. And I'm going to have little nuggets of encouragement every single week starting next week. All right. You're like, encourage me now, please. I will. I will. Don't worry. I will. But there's a lot of reasons to be afraid. And some people say, this is kind of the thesis around the around the, the series is some people say, we fear what we don't understand. Well, I would push back on that and say, well, you can't understand everything ever. We, we fear what we have not surrendered to God. That's how I would say it. Because it's, it's, it's an impossible task to understand everything. So are we supposed to be afraid of everything we can't understand? Absolutely not. We want to turn the things that we don't understand over to the care of God so that we can live a fearless life. Amen, everybody? That's starting next week. Starting next week. So those little cards that are next to you have QR codes on them, and it links out. Like if you hand them out or keep them for yourself, those QR codes go to a landing page that we do this every single series, by the way. It's not even fancy anymore. It's just normal. But it links out to a landing page that talks all about the series so that you can know what's coming up, and you can also share with your friends what's coming up. Another thing that's coming up is Growth Track. Growth Track is next week by the way. Get excited for Growth Track. I got like three people really excited for Growth Track and they're right on the front row, right where I expect you would be. That's cool. That's cool. Well, Growth Track is the place where you can join the dream team of the church, as we call it. We had a dream team party yesterday where we invited all of our hundred and something, I don't know how many, it's a lot nowadays, that all the people on the dream team come out and we did a little celebration for them and I'm telling you, next year, you don't have to miss out on that. That can be for you, Dream Team. But this is the opportunity. Growth Track is the opportunity for you to get on the Dream Team, discover your purpose, and begin to make a difference and be a lifeline in the community in a way that you're understanding your own calling, your own purpose. We do this every month, and it's called Growth Track. And childcare is provided. And, and we got food. Y'all, it's like, come on. It's teed up for you. All you got to do is show up. I encourage you to do so. Next week, it's going to be a lot of fun. So today we're concluding our series. We're concluding our series, The Bible. The Bi if you're sad, say, oh. Well, that was nice. That was really nice of you. Thank you for doing that. We're concluding this here with the most, I, I believe, these are the most, the sections of the Bible that we've been talking about all month long. 
This, I think, is the most practical and applicable section of the Bible that there is. Talking about the letters, the letters to the churches, the letters to the churches. Now, I just got a quick question for you. Does anybody like to write? Does anybody like to write letters? Yeah, me neither. It's cool. <laughs> I got like three hands. You are outnumbered big time because who likes to do that? Who likes to, to, to write? You know, um, I think it's a lost art. I think sitting down with a pen and paper is a lost art that we've kind of gone away from. Um, but actually, I'm going to date myself right now because I grew up watching uh, CMT. Who knows what CMT is? <laughs> Yeah, if you, yeah, that's right, that's right. Country music television. Back when country music used to be country music, back in the day. And there was this song that, I don't know, I couldn't get it out of my mind when I was getting, going over this letters sermon, that, and now they're, I'm going to sing a part of it, okay? So I want you to bear with me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it's about writing. It's about writing notes. It goes, do you love me? Do you want to be my friend? <laughs> And if you do, well, then don't be afraid to take me by the hand. If you want to, <laughs> I think this is how love goes. Check. Yeah. Check. <laughs> That's right. Come on. First service. I am putting it to second service. I don't think they can do better than that. I wasn't sure. But when I was growing up, that's like, this is what writing notes and writing letters meant was, yeah, I got two boxes and I'm going to hand this over to the love of my life. And she's going to let me know in no uncertain terms how she feels about me. It's a lost art indeed, right? So is that what these letters are? No, no, not at all. No. What are these letters? These letters are, are Romans to Revelation in the, in your Bible at the very end, Romans to Revelation. These are written by faith leaders to, to mostly uh, specific churches, specific churches, uh, sometimes to people like, I can't, I can't ever pronounce this guy's name. I used to call him Philemon, 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 whatever, man. Bible college in the back laughing at me right now, but that's okay. I'm, I'm secure in myself. I don't, I don't need to be right all the time. Philemon, like that was written to a person, but generally speaking, these were letters written by faith leaders to groups of churches and, uh, or to, to whole groups of people known as churches, Re reminding them how to live, reminding them about Jesus, uh, show showing them things that they, they needed to be. Sometimes there was actually letters that we don't have that went to these faith leaders, and then these were in response. These letters were in response to some of that. But I want to teach you just a couple things about these letters that I think are important. Number one is these letters, they originated from God. This is the first uh, fill in the blank for you, and I'm going to teach you about these letters first, and then I'm going to teach us what to do with these letters. But, but the first thing is these letters originated from God, like they're from him. They're not from people necessarily. I mean, they're written by people. We'll get to that. But they started with God. They started with God. I'm not God. They started with God. They started with God. These letters are, are vetted. They're verified, carefully chosen as having 100% truth in them with no fluff. Now, let me just tell you, you may not know this, and some of you do, there's other writings out there. There's other letters out there. The, the, the letter of Judas, and you're like, oh, I don't want to read that one, but there's other, le like the letter of Enoch. There's Enoch. There's other writings out there that, let me just tell you, the, le the, the letters that we have, the, the books of the Bible that we have are vetted, verified, 100% truth, nothing we don't need to have. 66 books in your Bible, trustworthy, all of them, and Another way we can see that is over the years, right around the, the year AD 50 to 100, to 100 the, the canon of scripture was closed. What canon is, you probably hear that term more often with Star Wars these days, because the, the canon of Star Wars is like, which movies count, right? Which movies, well, the letters, this is a biblical, like first, it's a biblical term. It's, it's, it's part of the story. It's part of what we can trust, depend on. These letters we have, they originated with God. Now listen to this, 2 Timothy. We, this, we've been reading this every single week for this whole series, but let's, let's hear it again. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what's true and make us realize what's wrong in our lives. Now, of course, this is Paul, the apostle Paul, writing to his protege, Timothy, and uh, um, like I said, all 66 books that, that are contained right here, he was speaking about the Old Testament, but this pertains, this scripture pertains to all 66 books that we have. There's no more than that. Don't go reading more books than that. It's important to me that you know. 
not to be reading other books like they're the Bible. They're not. These books that we have, these letters that we have are vetted, verified, and confirmed, and poured over, and these are what matter to our faith. Th these letters are what inform our faith, teach us how to live, correct us when we're wrong, and all of those things. The main point is this. Although the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, were penned by human hands, they originated in the heart of God, and that makes them inerrant. They're not wrong. They're never wrong. They're always right, and even if we don't understand them, they're right. So that means we, we, we depend on this word. We believe the Bible teaches X, Y, Z. Like we, we've got to start, our faith has to start there, is, is what do I believe the Bible teaches about how I'm supposed to live my life? It's like if, if Pastor Tiffany, she's sitting right here on the front row, right? And I'm talking like I normally do. I'm talking like always, okay? Always talking, but she's writing. Imagine this. I'm talking, she's writing, she's writing everything down. Now, she may have written everything, but where did it originate? It originated from me. It's the same way with God, all right? It originated from him, his voice, his heart, but penned by human hand. And that leads me to the, the next point that I want you to know is that these letters were composed by people. And it's important to understand that too. Because if we only, only consider the fact that, this, that the word of God is from God, we'll forget the fact that it was written by imperfect people. We're talking about John, Paul, James. Is that one person, John, Paul, James? Is that a person? I'm not sure. That's three different people I'm talking about. John, Paul, James, Peter, Jude. I mean, just like us, these people were not perfect, but God still used them to record his truth and his word to us. That's important for us to know because a lot of us get a, um, there's a superiority complex. And what's the other one? inferiority complex, where we feel we can't have anything to do with God's big plan. Well, well, let's see what the scripture has to say about that. Acts chapter four, the members of the Jewish council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were, say this word with me, ordinary. They're ordinary. Ordinary people, ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus, ordinary men, but men that have been with Jesus. And that's, that should describe all of us, ordinary. Man, there's nothing wrong with it. Let's be ordinary. And let's just be regular for Jesus. Amen. Come on, somebody. That's a quote. We're going to put that on Twitter right now. Be, let's be ordinary for Jesus. Let's just be normal. Actually, that's kind of asking a lot these days, isn't it? <laughs> let's just be normal for Jesus. Let's be ordinary, regular, stand up, go to work, come home, love our spouse, love our family, live a quiet life for Jesus. And what, am I preaching like a game-changing message right now? Come on, let's be ordinary for you. That's exactly what they were. These people are like you and me, unspectacular in and of themselves. But let me tell you this, God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And I want you to hear that. God uses ordinary people, just like you, just like me, to do extraordinary things. Let's talk about it. Adam and Eve, they were deceived from the very, very beginning. Noah, he actually got drunk when he finally landed his ship. Jonah ran from God. We talked about Jonah a little bit, didn't we? Well, let's talk about Abraham. Abraham actually lied about his wife. Abraham uh, cheated on his wife with his wife's permission. Come on, how crazy is that? Jacob was a deceiver. Moses had a stuttering problem. Elijah, the prophet, was suicidal. David, King David, killed a man, slept with his wife. Solomon started worshiping other gods. Paul persecuted Christians. Peter denied Jesus, and Lazarus was dead. What's your excuse? What's your, oh, I can't, be, I can't be used for God. What's your excuse? What's, what's standing in your way from being ordinary for Jesus? God uses ordinary, broken people to do extraordinary things. And I want you to get that into your heart. And I want you to, I want you to go for it. Let's be ordinary for Jesus. Number three, the letters disclose how God feels about us. And this is where we're going to spend a lot of our time today. Probably the rest of our time is talking about this idea right here, that the letters disclose or reveal or just tell us how God feels about us. And your first thought might be this, well, God loves us. He loves us. And while that's true, 
it is absolutely true. Love is not a feeling. It's not, it's not a feeling. Anybody who's been in church a little, a little length of time knows that love isn't a feeling. It's a choice. It's a covenant. It goes deeper than just how I feel about you today. It's when we stand you know, in front of the minister and we make all these vows and these covenants together. Love is choosing. It's, it's choosing for life to make a decision. But the letters disclose what I'm talking about is how he feels about us. Because a lot of people think this. You may not have articulated it this way, but a lot of people think this. He loves us. Maybe he loves me, but he doesn't really like me. <laughs> he, lo- he loves me, but he doesn't really like me. Come on, parents, you know the feeling. You're laughing nervously right now. You're like, I cannot. Those are only thoughts in my head. I can't say it out loud. If you have kids at all, you know what this feeling is like. I love my kids, but sometimes... Just saying, well, God doesn't just love us and is like, those idiots, they're doing it, they're being dumb again. And we certainly are. There's a lot of things in our life that need to change. Any one of us, if we sat down with each other, there's things in our life that need to change and we need to go back to the Bible and start living our our lives a different way. But just because God loves us doesn't mean he doesn't like us. What I'm trying to show you in scripture, and I'm about to right now, is that God not only loves us, he cares very deeply for us. He likes us. He, he, He likes you. Watch, it's all in Ephesians. Uh, I tried to put it on one screen. We'll see if I can pull it off or not. Ephesians, starting in chapter one, it says in, in, in verse 11, he chose us. He chose us. Chapter two, verse 10 says, we are his masterpiece. This is not just, oh, I'm suffering to these darn humans again. No, 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 no. We're his masterpiece. Chapter two, verse 19, we are members of God's family. Uh, chapter Three, verse 19, his love for us is experienced and too great to understand fully. If you read the book of Ephesians, it not only shows that God loves us, it's that he really does care about us, that he feels very strongly that he has affection towards us. I'm not talking about some carnal human way. I'm talking about like the deep sense of we get our emotions from him and he is emotionally tied to us too. He cares very deeply for us. He cares very deep, and I want you to get that. Yes, he loves us, but he wants to show it. He wants to explain it. He wants to prove it. And not just once with Jesus dying on the cross, mind you. No, 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 no. He gave us something to read over and over again to prove it, to prove it. And that's why I'm trying to, to show us that, that the scriptures, and especially these letters, are like God's love letters to us. That's what they're like. They're like God's love letters to us. It's, it's an expression of affection and that he wants to show. I want you to have this because he did. Like I said last week, he didn't have to do this. God didn't have to put it all in writing. He didn't have, he didn't have to do anything he didn't want to do. God chose this method of letter writing and people preaching to other people and then recording it and all that. Like th- think that through. It didn't have to be that way. But he chose that because he wanted us to be able to keep something like a love letter that we can have. And when we need it, we we can take it out and read it again. He really does care about me, doesn't he? I want you to get that today. It's It's like a man courting a woman. You know, the church is his bride after all. And it just so happens I actually have a real love letter to show you today. And it's not even from me. Um, This is a letter that my dad wrote my mom when they were dating back in the 70s, okay? And I've got a whole stack of them right here on the front row. I've got a stack like this and they're all like faded. Like it's so old, there's not even lines on the paper, okay? (laughs) That's how old this paper is. They hadn't thought of having lines on it yet. This is how old. And look at that writing. (laughs) Sorry, dad. (laughs) If you're watching this, I'm so sorry. Um, But look at that writing. He should have been a doctor. I don't know. Um, you want to you wanna hear some of this? Because yeah. my, my dad and mom, they, they met at a wedding. It was actually kind of a setup. My, my dad was the, the, the best man. I, I should know what these things are. I just have to hunt for them. He's the best man, and my mom was the maid of honor. And so this was their best friends were getting married, and they didn't, had not met each other, but they kind of got set up a little bit because the husband and wife, um, Roland and Heather, uh, cho- they were like, oh, man, these two. They're going to hit it off. They're going to really hit it off. And after one day, you know, so my dad was from Southern California. 
my mom was from Northern California and they, they, they flew in, came to this wedding. And after one day, they, they knew this was going to work out. They, they knew it and they got each other's address because back then, um, long distance calls were a lot more expensive and harder to, and they were just, you know, they were young, they were on a budget. And so they didn't have long distance. I mean, nowadays we wouldn't even think about that, but they had to get each other's address and, and they wrote each other. And this right here, up here, you can't read it. It's fine. I'll read it to you, but it's, it's the next day. So the very next day after the wedding that they, you know, they, it was like a week long thing. But as soon as he went home, my dad, what a guy wrote this letter. And I want to read you just a little bit of it. It says, dear Cheryl, my mom's name is Cheryl. My dad's name is Paul. Dear Cheryl, how have you been working hard at some restaurant? I can't pronounce, I suppose. Now the week of partying is over. It's back to the old grind again. And now I'm back to slaving over facts, figures, pencils, adding machines, yellow paper, and all other things. My dad's an accountant. I think he was an auditor at the time. Not a poet, by the way. <laughs> but, but check this out. Slaving over these things. I'm even going to be working this weekend since I'm now a little behind. I guess I shouldn't complain, though. You have to work weekends, too. <laughs> and then there's this part. I got permission to read this. How is everyone doing after recovering from the reception? <laughs> is April still hungover? <laughs> Say hi to everyone for me. Say hi to Roland. Say hi to Heather. Say hi to Jim, Ed, and everyone. But most of all, say hi to Cheryl. And in parentheses, he wrote, that means you. <laughs> I have thought of you constantly since I left Wednesday evening, and I really miss you. The time we had together was wonderful, though short, and I would have given anything to be able to stay longer. Say la vie. I feel I've gotten to know you pretty well for the short time we had together, and I've grown to care for you a lot. I hope you feel the same way. It goes on and on. But um, what I'm, I just got these stacks of, of letters. Can you believe that? It's amazing. There's like 30 each. There's a whole bunch that they wrote each other for a really long time. What I want to show you about this is that my dad is like the most reserved. He's an accountant and he looks like one. Pocket protector. Quiet. Doesn't like people too much, you know. He, like, he likes people fine. I'm, I'm joking around, but he likes his Sudoku. He doesn't like big crowds. He doesn't like, you know, a lot of interaction, you know. And he's like, he's private. He's shy, strong. But you put a man with a pen and a piece of paper alone with his thoughts talking to a woman that he wants to spend the rest of his life with, it's different, you know? It's different. You don't get that kind of communication having a, ha, talking across like this. It's, it's I'm talking to you and you're thinking about what you're going to say to me and then you're talking and then I'm thinking about what I'm going to say to you. It's different. This is different. You're alone with it. I write it and I tell you everything I want to say and I don't have any interruptions and, I'm, and I just put it all in there and then I send it out and it's gone. It's gone. Now it's, the ball's in your court. And then the receiver gets that and doesn't have the benefit of asking any questions, doesn't have the benefit of, of getting any clarification. You just, you sit there and you read it and you're going to read the whole thing. And you read the whole thing and then you just sit with it and you just take it in and you digest it. What does that remind you of? This is the way God chose to communicate to us. It's like letters. He's like, I'm going to put it all out on the table for you. And I just want you to sit with it. And I want you to take it all in. And I'm going to tell you everything that you need. Everything that I want you to know is all right here. I want to tell you that, that God chose this way. And, and when I got these letters, it just blew my mind because I got a glimpse of how God feels about us. He was writing to us. He was writing to us. He knew he was, there was going to be some separation. He knew there was going to be, well, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the connection with him. But Jesus was here. All those faith leaders were here. And then he wrote these letters. And he says, I want to give it all to you. I want you to have it. My parents are coming up on 45 years of marriage. Are you surprised? I'm not. Not after seeing what they went, the waiting, the patience, the sacrifice. I've never heard my dad talk like that a day in my life. Not a day. Not a single day. I'm serious. I've never heard my dad talk like that. But it's really revealing. And now I get a better glimpse of, of who he is. And then I used to think all my, my poetic, talkative, outgoing side came from my mom. 
I don't know about that. My dad kind of, he's kind of a killer, man. <laughs> he's kind of a killer. Um, these are God's love letters to us. And so I want to talk to you about what love letters should do. Because I think, because what do we do with that? We make God our Valentine now? <laughs> no, no, not at all. That's not what that means. But what should be happening is, is these letters should change us. Because let me just tell you, I think when my mom read these, it changed her. It changed her perception of him. It changed the way that she viewed what love could even be from a person. Because she had never experienced that. I got more stories, but I'm going to save them for later. It's <laughs> such a big week for me. But they should change us. They should change us. And so what I want to teach you about these letters is this. Number one, the letters teach us to know and have his character. So these are applications now. We ought to know and have his character. It's one thing to know it. It's another thing to have it, to be it. These letters were perfectly suited to reveal God's character. Perfectly suited. These letters are perfectly suited to tell us everything we need to know about God, God's character. Like with my dad, writing didn't change who my dad was or how he felt. It simply revealed it. And that's what these letter do, letters do for God. It doesn't change who he is. It just reveals who he is. So what, what do God's love letters reveal to us? It's in the scriptures. First John, starting in chapter four, says this, dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God for what? God is love. That is his character. Like none of us could possibly know in our human state, God is love. And you're thinking to yourself, well, what about all the things God's mad at? What about all the things that God doesn't like? Yeah, love hates those things. Love is at odds with the things that God is at odds with. Because if, if God is at odds with anything that we find here, that means love is at odds with those things. That's a, that's, that was too deep, I think. We'll keep going. <laughs> that, was too, that was a lot. That was a big statement right there. That's okay. God is love. That is his character. And we are created in his image. We're created to be like him. We're, we're, we're created to, to love others. We're created to, to, to love others, love God and ourselves because he first loved us. Listen to this, John 13. Now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. This is Jesus speaking. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other for your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for each other is gonna be the proof to the world, to a lost, hurting, lonely world. That's going to be the proof. The way you love one another is the way that the world knows that you're my disciples. Love, again, not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. It's a choice. It's a sacrifice. This is God's character, and it needs to be ours as well. So what does this mean? With our kids, you know, for those parents in the room, how do we love our kids? If love isn't a feeling, it's a choice. That means we ought to sacrifice for our children. That means we ought to sacrifice for them, discipline them. Did you know that God says God disciplines those he loves? The Bible says this. His letters, his love letters says discipline is good because when we're wrong, we need to know it. Like if we're living in a lifestyle that is not good for us, love doesn't say, ah, well, I don't want to make you mad at me. No, love says I, I want to help you. I don't want you to be hurt. I don't want you to be hurt in the afterlife. Sometimes the hurt doesn't even occur here. It occurs there. But love, love says, even for our kids right now, it says, I'm willing to not be your friend in this moment because I love you enough to be your mom or your dad. That's love. That's love. We need to love our kids like that because even God disciplines those he loves. What does it mean to love your spouse? If it's not a feeling, if it's not just Valentine's Day every day for your spouse, if love is more than that, well, then what does that mean? Loving your spouse means sacrificing for them. Same thing. It's sac love is sacrifice. It's letting your spouse have their way. And I got every single eye to roll in the house. You're like, oh gosh. But this is huge. This is huge right now because in our society, in our culture, in our world, the stresses and pressures that we face, guess who has to deal with that? Your spouse. 
all that anxiety, all that pressure, all that stress, all that hardship that you're facing, there's one person the most that's going to feel all that. That's your spouse. And so loving your spouse means I, I need to make your life my goal. Because when I stood in front of that pastor, when I stood in front of Pastor Ken and made vows to Tiffany that said, hmm, nah. <laughs> we, on the, we all weepy on the front row today. Um, when I stood in front of my pastor and said, in sickness and in health, in good times and bad, for rich or for poor, it's, that's what love means. It means that not just when it's Valentine's Day. That means when we're down and out and when we're really struggling and, and we've had to deal with this and I've had to do this, say, you know what? I want your life to be complete. I want every dream that you have to come true, even at the expense of my dream, because that's the vow I made. The vow I made is to make your life wonderful and to lift you up. And that's, that's the song of both. And that's when you get a really great marriage is when both people are saying that same thing. My, my life's purpose. Once I married you, I'm one flesh with you now. And my goal, my job is to, is to lift you up and to bring you closer to God and to bring your dreams to fruition and to help you to achieve all the things that God has designed you for. That's, that's my pleasure now. That's my job now. That's what I live for now. And I'm just blessed that Tiffany feels the same way. And even if she didn't, I, I vowed to do that. I vowed to do that. Marriages, man. There's no, there's no more important relationship. There's no more important relationship in the world, marriages. And it's on my heart a lot. Okay, in your finances. What does it mean to love in your finances? You're like, wait, what? Get out of my pocket, pastor. No, 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 no. Finances are important. Finances are really, really important because even your finances show where your love lies. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. <laughs> he didn't say your finances are going to follow your heart. He said, where your finances are, your heart will follow. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I'm going to say some things that you're going to hate. Mortgage and car payments. <laughs> is that before generosity and giving? You're like, obviously, where our, where our treasure is, there our heart will ultimately be. Our heart will ultimately be where, where we put our, the most chips on the table. Where, where First, I'm going to pay all those bills first. And then maybe if I have time to do what God said with, with money, then maybe I'll do that. Well, maybe we ought to rethink that. Maybe we ought to reframe what love would say about that. If, I have a, if I've been saved by, by the Lord, the Lord rescued me. You know my testimony. It's an extreme one. But God lifted me out of that life, set my feet on solid ground I have a unique perspective that I hope you can one day share with me that what do I have that's not his? The kingdom of God comes first in my life and that's, that informs every single decision I make. That means if you say I'm supposed to tithe and give and do all that, I'm done, done. You don't need, need to say it twice, God. I'm on it. I'm on it first and foremost because where my treasure is, I want my heart to be in the kingdom of God too. That means I'm gonna put my finances in the kingdom of God. So I can, am, I, am I making any sense today? You're like, go to the next point, pastor. Okay, fine, I will. God showed his love by giving, last thing. He showed his love by giving. And he gave first before we could even reciprocate. God so loved the world that he gave his son. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he gave before there was a payoff. And it wasn't an investment. It was like, no, I'm just willing to give because that's what love does. It gives. It gives risky it gives because it's the right thing to do. It gives because that's who God is and we're designed in his image. Okay, okay. Number two, number two, the letters were written for everyone to receive and to share his love. Let's say that again. The letters were written for everyone. Say everyone, everyone to receive and share. That means for us today. That means whoever you are, wherever you come from, everyone around you, listen to this, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. When I am with those who are weak, I share in their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, when I try, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save who? Some. I'm going to do everything I can for everyone, knowing they're not all going to come, but just for a few, I'll do it. Just for a few. 
Paul wrote and lived that out pretty well. He was imprisoned, he was ridiculed, he was beaten, he was mocked, and he did all of that so that some could be saved. And I think he did a pretty good job. And the Bible teaches us to meet people where they're at because God met us where we were at. Not to leave us there. How how rude would it be for God to meet me in my pain just to leave me there? To meet me in my sin just to leave me there? To meet me in my destructive behavior just to leave me there? That would be rude. <laughs> right? That would be rude. No, he meets me there so that he can help me out. So that he can set my feet on solid ground like I've been saying. Like that's the whole point. But he made the first move. He met me. He didn't wait. He wasn't sitting up there on his cloud, arms folded. Well, you know, if he wanted to get saved, maybe he'll do something about it. No. God didn't behave like that. No, he met me where I was at. And that's what, that's what God says we ought to do. We need to meet people where they're at. Look, we don't, we don't got a lot of rules for people to come in our doors. We don't. We don't. Why is that? Because God meets people where they're at, not to leave them there. But everyone ought to have the opportunity to hear God's message and respond to it. Everyone. And we'll even make the first step. It makes me think of, uh, you know, our value. It's written on one of these walls. There it is. We engage people. These values mean something to us. They're not just wall art. We make the first move to meet people where they are. The first move makes me think of every series. You know, we, we, we hand out these, these little cards, right? And we put a lot of energy and work into video editing, graphic design, and, and, and putting everything out there. And then we give cards so that we can hand them out. Why do we do all that? It's a lot of work. You are, you are here already. Why do we do all that? Why? It's because we want to create tools so that you can go out and reach your friends, reach your family, reach your coworkers, and actually do something and, and show them, look, I'm willing to meet you where you are. Even if you don't come in here, I still want to help you. I still want to pray for you. I still want to be present with you in your problems so I can be a blessing to you. Because, God, because people who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. It's a life verse of mine. And it, and it speaks to this value. We meet people where they are. Why? So that everyone will come to church? Not necessarily, but some will. But some will. And they'll experience the best life change out of anybody. And I hope you can get that. I hope you can see why we do this. I hope that you don't see these little cards and these little new series and reasons for people to come. This is not pithy. This is not just little, little cool little things. No, we, we're trying to reach people. We're trying to reach people. And we're willing to invest money. We're willing to invest time. We're willing to invest resources, our, our, our energy, so that we can get out of our walls and get out into the world where we live and help people come into the love of God. I hope you see that. And I hope you take one of these cards with you and go, hey, who, who, you know, whatever you do it, however you do it, just be yourself. Anything else would be not appropriate. And, and do we stop there? No, no, once they get here, guess what? Then we say, hey, come to Grow Track with us. And then what do we do? All of us leaders, we're here from seven in the morning. And then at noon, five hours later, we got lunch, we got childcare. And we're anybody who wants to know your purpose, we're gonna stay long for you. We're gonna stay extra time for you. We're gonna take you through a spiritual gifts test. We're gonna see where you could, where you could work out the very, very best for your calling. And we're dog tired. <laughs> Have I ever mentioned that we're dog tired in growth track and we do it with a big old smile on our face? Why? Because we make the first move. Man, if anybody wants that, man, you might be fresh, but we're not, but we're still willing to do it. And we're still willing to, to let you in and, and we're going to spend money on food for you and we're going to get childcare for you and we're going to get all these resources and booklets and that's all work. We do all that because we want to engage people where they are so that some can know his love. Are you getting this? Yeah. Are you seeing what this means to us? Because that's what God did for us. Sorry for yelling. <laughs> we make the first move. We make the first investment, the first sacrifice for first timers and long timers, simply so that we can meet people where they are in their walk with God and help them along to their next steps. Last thing I want to tell you, let God's letters win your heart. 
let his letters win your heart. Just like these letters won my mom's heart, let these letters win your heart. And I'm, and I'm talking to everybody today, okay? I'm not just talking to those that are very first time. No, 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 no. You, maybe you've been here 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. But you've been, you've, been, you've been playing it out. You know, you've just been showing up to church. You've just been doing it. And you know, God bless you. You're just, you're, you're just doing it. You're going for it. But it hasn't happened, you know? It hasn't, it hasn't impacted you. Oh, I pray it does. I pray it would, it would hit you. I pray that God's love would hit you different today. That his letters, that, would, that when you go home today, or, or tomorrow morning when you read the scriptures, that you would see that he loves you, cares about you. Not only does he love you, he likes you. He thinks about you. He's got all these plans for you. He's put a lot of thought into this. Let all of that change your life. Let all of that change your, your heart. And it's actually an important word, heart. And I don't mean the thumping muscle inside, inside your chest. Thump, 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 thump. I don't mean change my heart. Yeah, I do have a, I do have a weak ticker. Yeah, let, okay, God, you can fix my... No, no, no. I'm not talking about that. I mean your mind. I mean your will. I mean your emotions. I'm talking about your soul. Listen to what it says in, in, in Romans 10. Romans 10. This is Paul writing to the church in Rome. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is by believing in your, that you are made right with God. And it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. So what's that mean? Thump, thump, I believe, thump, thump, I believe. No, no, this, this word, heart, that Paul used in Romans 10, cardia, like cardioid, like, like a heart. It's used 147 times in scripture. And it's meant to reference the real you, your thought life, your, your mind, your will, your emotions, your thoughts. The, it's the real you. In other words, Paul says, it's by believing in your heart you're made right. He's saying, when you accept his love and it changes your inner self. Are you seeing that? When, when you accept his love and it changes your thoughts, when you accept his love and it changes your emotions, when you accept his love and it changes your inner self, it changes your, your motivation, it changes your thoughts, it changes what makes you cry, it changes what makes you laugh, it changes what makes you mad, it changes what you will tolerate, it changes what you will forgive because in your heart, your, your thoughts, your inner self, you believe, and it changes everything about you because it's changed your inner self. Are you seeing the difference? Don't read that scripture the same way anymore. It's not talking about your heart. It's talking about yourself, your soul, who you are as a person. Because when all of that changes, that's when you're saved. It changes you from the inside. It's not a box you check. We got a lot of processes around here. We, they're, they're good for us. They help us. But it, it's when it changes your in, the inside of you, when God's love changes the inside of you, that's when you're saved. That's when you're really saved because it changes, it changes how you live your whole life. It changes the way you filter every decision you make. It changes everything. That's what God's love letters are intended to do for us. Just like it did for my mom when my dad wrote her. It changed her on the inside. It changed what she thought. It changed how she felt. It changed what she was willing to tolerate. After a couple of these letters, she was able to tolerate a lot more from my dad. <laughs> it's true though, because she knew, she knew this man cares about me. This man really cares about me. When you know God cares about you, you can tolerate some discipline. When you know God loves you, you can tolerate him saying, hey, that life, that you're, that you're living right now, it's gotta change. But when you have it on the inside, you know, okay, he loves me, cares about me. These letters are intended to motivate us and I hope they do, to spend your life with him. Allow your heart to be changed today. Allow your heart to be changed today. That's what I'm gonna pray for you about. 
Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. That's my prayer for you. Father, change our heart today. Change our, our inner self today. We're so grateful. We're so thankful. But Lord, I know some of us, we need that. We need a change today. We need a breakthrough today. We, we, we want to love you. We even say we love you. But the inside, we're still holding on to unforgiveness. On the inside, we're still holding on to anger. On the inside, we're still holding on to some pet things that we want to keep. But Lord, let your love change us today. If you, if you want that, if you need that, if you're ready for that, that's my invitation to you. Let his love change you today. Let his love change you today. Whether it's a first decision that you've made for him or whether it's time to come back after a time away. If you're ready for his love to change you, would you just lift your hand up right now in this place? Come on, lift it up. Yes, 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 yes. Um, too many, too many to count today. Well, church, the ball's in your court. Let's pray it right now with our heads down, with our eyes closed. If that's your prayer, if you're ready to receive that love today and let it change you, just pray this prayer like it's your very own and pray it right after me. Say, Father God, I give you my heart. I give you myself, my whole life. Forgive me of my sins. Make me new. Fill me with your spirit. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sins. Show me how to live. In Jesus' name, amen.